Well, it's nice to be here and see a lot of old friends, hopefully some, some new ones um, as, as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, that's the title I had to give some time ago. The real title is Six Things to Know About um, virtual, re <laughs> <laughs> virtual Reality. So, um, <laughs> uh, and I'm really, I'm really pleased uh, to be here. Uh, so number one, uh, virtual and physical reality are not clearly differentiated by humans. And I think that's a very important thing to realize, and I'm certain most of the people in this room, if not all, uh, understand that. I first got into to VR um, in, a, in a way that's uh, similar, to, uh, similar to this. Ooh, what's that doing? There we go. Uh, and I, I watched somebody, this is Jack Loomis's lab, uh, which is now turned down. I, the door was open and I watched, uh, actually not this person, but a young woman um, walking around like this. And uh, his lab was kind of across the hall from my, from my, and it dawned on me that that person was somewhere psychologically other than where they were uh, physically. And uh, so I said, Jack, I'd really like to, uh, I'd really like to try that. And he said, okay. A couple of days later, I went into the thing, and uh, this this kind of uh, depicts the experience, although not with the kind of the green grid, but it'll turn to what it was, uh, what it was like much more. It was much more like that. And um, Jack said, you know, walk up to the edge of that, and I did. And he said, look down. And I did, and he said, um, you know, uh, gravity is turned off. You can just walk over that pit. And I couldn't do it. <laughs> and I doubt many people could do it. And he said, um, so much for the visual clip studies. Um, or, at least, or maybe I'm still in my infancy. But um, he said, I'll put a board down. And so the magic board appeared, and I started tentatively out on that. Board, and I said, Jack, I can't see my feet. And of course, he wasn't rendering the feet. I said, you know, if there, if there's some way, I, if he had a real board here where I could walk across and feel, you know, I know where I was, it'd be a little better to feel the edges. And so he said, we can do that. And so there was a real board registered with the virtual board. And as I felt the edges, I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> <laughs> so that haptic sensation. And I had a really hard time getting across there. Uh, this is a kind of demo we do all the time. About 50% of adults won't walk across it at all. Uh, many years later, 15 years later perhaps, or 14 or 15 years later, I had the opportunity to do this again at, at uh, my former postdoc and now professor at Stanford's lab, Jeremy Valens, and I realized I hadn't, I hadn't done this since. And so I got on the thing. I had all these guests there from the, the Center for Advanced Study, and I said, I better do this. And um, I realized I was just if not more fearful, but I convinced myself, Jim, just gently take steps, walk across that plank. And as I started, my knees buckled all by themselves. And they caught me. Uh, to save a thirty thousand dollars, <laughs> uh, and so, so there's a lot of bottom up stuff uh, that goes on and can go on in, in, in virtual reality, and that, this is a kind of a very convincing kind of exhibit for people to say, yeah, it's it's all just make believe. Well, yeah, it is make believe, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. So I asked Jack. I said, you know, imagine what a social psychologist could do with this, and he said, it's music to my ears. Let's start a center. And I won't go into that history, but we did. Um, now, there are lots of ways that we get into uh, virtual worlds. Um, if you've ever been in Palo Alto, you wonder about this little kid fishing uh, against the post office wall. <laughs> and of course, um, that's just uh, art, that's just Trump Olay, that's Dan Brown, Greg Brown's uh, work. We have better work in Santa Barbara, <laughs> and that's coming up, I think, in a couple of weeks, right? Memorial Day weekend. Uh, so there are many ways that we get sucked into illusions as if they're, as if they're not illusions. And um, <clears throat> particularly with automatic processes uh, that operate quickly. However, it's more than, it's more than that. Um, for some people, <clears throat> their 
actual physical world, or what I call grounded reality, is different than other people's. So that is actually uh, John Nash, the uh, Nobel, the supposed, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, who, um, as the movie depicted, I don't know how true it is, actually hallucinated the presence of other people uh, that, that most of the people around him never saw. But for John Nash, that was his reality. Then we, <coughs> some of us are old enough to remember both these guys. Uh, there's the son of Sam who heard voices. So there's a lot of there's a lot of reality that isn't shared among people, and we seem to be very fluid in a dynamic way in terms of what constitutes our reality at any time. I find that problem uh, from reviewers. They just don't share the same reality. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a recent Huff Post posting uh, in the last few days of uh, physicists are now convinced they have a way to test whether we're really just inside a simulation, inside a simulation. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, so physical and, and virtual reality are not clearly differentiated by humans. That's, that's the first kind of assumption we make. That's the first thing we do. So the second thing is... Uh, <coughs> That reality involves the constant inputs of both the mind and the senses. And practically speaking, at least, all reality is a state of mind. This is what I believe. Um, a long time ago, and I'm sure a few people in here know who that person is, George Stratton was a professor at Berkeley in the late 1800s. And as far as we can tell, um, he did the first prism glass. Uh, experiment. Um, and so he got up early one morning in the dark of his room and he had all the shades down and, and put on prism glasses uh, that inverted everything uh, 180 degrees, left his bedroom, went out, and within a fairly short period of time, a couple of, a few hours maybe, um, everything seemed right side up to him. And he went about his day working, he came back. Uh, to his room. This is reported in a Psych Review article in the 1890s. Uh, it's just a description. And uh, went into the bedroom in the dark, took off, slept, got up in the morning, did it again. Um, and uh, the third day, uh, early in the third day, he, uh, he, took off, he took off the glasses. And as probably many of you know, uh, the world was inverted when he took them off. And it took him a while for things to uh, invert, invert again, and that's all very interesting because, of course, um, everything comes to our retina inverted to begin with. So clearly, there's something going on in the brain and mind uh, that writes things, um, and and I think not just in a straight perceptual sense, but in in other ways as well. So I got thinking after a couple of years with Jack. <laughs> I got to thinking, you know, if you're going to study virtual reality, maybe you ought to have some idea of what reality is. And of course, that's a question like, what is consciousness? And uh, it's very, very difficult uh, to, to answer, but you at least ought to be able to try and, and have some idea. So, you know, I began wondering, what is reality, what's real, and what's not? Uh, and that's that's a very interesting problem that that philosophers and perceptionists and others far brighter than I have, have, uh, have tackled. Uh, nonetheless, I pressed on. Um, so for most people, that's the real world, right? And that's a virtual world. That's just a shot out of Second Life from, a, from, several, from several years ago. Are both worlds real? Are both worlds real? Hmm. Maybe not. A few centuries ago, that was the real world. <laughs> They're simply both representations. You know, one is a photograph, and you know, one is a map as best that can be drawn. Um, <clears throat> are both of these worlds real? Well, one's uh, one's uh, physical, and one is is essentially bits. Um, I think they both are. I think they both are real. And if we keep making the distinction that, oh, this is just a virtual world, uh, we lose a lot of insights into the psychology and 
the communication and perceptual aspects of the whole thing. Of course, uh, great perceptionists, uh, including Aldous Huxley, Roger Shepard, and I dare say, although I don't know this for sure, John Foley, who's in the room, <laughs> talk about um, everything being an illusion. Um, so, so all reality is a perceptual illusion. The um, <clears throat> little side note, uh, a very interesting guy named Jim Morrison happened to read this book and founded a group that those of us who are old enough in the room know about um, and, and literally took their name from, uh, from Huxley's book. We also know that there are illusionists and we're dumbfounded by what they can do and uh, before our very eyes do things that we think are physically impossible. And of course the, the big one in America is Houdini. There are comparable people in other cultures all over the world. We seem to enjoy illusions in many ways and certainly perceptionists uh, and, and do this all the time. Um, so our mind can be tricked into um, either not believing what we see or into believing what we see. And I file more on the believing what we see kind of side of the side of that issue. So with no fear, let me tell you what I think is the nature of reality. <laughs> okay. um, I have this concept with apologies to Einstein and others called psychological relativity. And all of this means is that um, <clears throat> we can think about relativity of place. You know, certainly others have thought about relativity of time and motion, but what about relativity of place or space, if you will? Um, and this is where the construct of psychological relativity comes in. And the way I describe it, is for everybody there's a grounded reality. We, we may have a need, but we think there's something that's real. And, uh, and then there's stuff that we think is not real. So <clears throat> grounded reality uh, is not the same as virtual reality, and we can make that distinction. Now for most of us, uh, at least some of the time, uh, grounded reality kind of, uh, kind of predominates. And so that's what we call real, and whatever it is, and everything else is virtual reality. Uh, sometimes virtual reality can predominate, and we know that there are people who can't get out of virtual reality in a pathological sense, in a, in a psychological sense. Um, at least five years ago, uh, South Korea recognized this problem. People have died in virtual reality games in South Korea, uh, playing marathon kind of games, as some of, some of you know. Uh, three years ago, and maybe more now, there were 180 rehab centers for, for virtual addiction uh, in, in South Korea. Um, I don't know what's special about South Korea. I doubt anything except that they are treating this. Um, and uh, uh, in many ways, it may be a bad thing, um, but uh, I'm sure this kind of addiction occurs all over the place. In films, of course, there are <laughs> always depictions of virtual reality things. There are dozens and dozens of these kind of films and movies. So, um, uh, is there anybody who hasn't seen The Matrix in here? Everybody's seen The Matrix, please. <laughs> which is the best movie ever made <laughs> with the worst actors. <laughs> uh, but when you think about it, uh, it, it you probably many of you have probably seen The Truman Show as well. So uh, it's, really, it's really the same exact... You guys can come right back. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, the theme is really the same. The only difference between what's depicted is the technology to create the illusion. And in one case, it's, it's, you know, plug in the brain and it's digital. In the other, it's hammer and nails. But it's the same exact, it's the same exact theme. And uh, just to add uh, inception on in our dreams to the situation, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a big theme. There are a lot of films. There are a lot of books. Uh, you know, uh, Neil Stevenson stuff and, and all of those books are, are, just, are just amazing. So we're constantly 
uh, in a kind of intellectual and scholarly and artistic and entertainment way, really go over these issues culturally all the time. So it suggests that as a race, we're not sure. Okay, so that's the second thing. Reality involves the constant inputs of both the mind and the senses, and I come down on the side of all reality is just a state of mind. And that is the simple reality problem. I have no pretense at whatever the, <coughs> answering the hard reality problem. So, <coughs> the other thing we learned early on was that virtual reality tools, um, first of all, are both endogenous and exogenous. And I'll just go over a little bit of history here. So we don't, um, we don't argue that virtual reality is limited to any specific technology. And of course, um, you see in, the, in popular press and advertisements and people are selling things, etc. cetera, uh, virtual reality seems to be connected with digital. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it, that's helpful in a scientific way, and there's all sorts of of ways of adding modifiers to that term, like augmented reality and you know this, that, and the other thing, that try to get more specific. Uh, but these technologies have been around a long, long time. The endogenous ones, so it's not necessarily digital. Um, the endogenous ones, whoops. Uh, yeah, the endogenous ones. Um, come on, start with there. Start with the. The brain. Okay, we um, we dream sometimes in a scary, fearful way, sometimes in a very pleasant way, and we daydream all the time. Okay, so if any of you know John School Jonathan Schooler's work and in our department and and uh, other people, um, you may know how many times our minds wander in a day. Anybody know? 2,000. This is during waking hours, and that includes tuning out uh, on purpose or zoning out. Okay. So, in about a waking hour, that's about 125 times. So, I'll make a deal with you. If you keep it down to about 30, <laughs> I will try to do the same. Okay. <laughs> All right, there are <coughs> pharmacological agents which will take us, uh, take us places. Um, some people have traveled to, etc. And there are pharmacological agents that will bring us back. That's just Thorazine, which is um, apparently what Jonathan Nash was, was, what John Nash was. Doing. So, we do this endogenously all the time. But we also historically have created many, many, many tools to help us do this, and it seems that most of them, maybe all of them, are still around. We can't tell, because if something disappeared, it disappeared. But uh, these exogenous tools uh, probably started either with drumming uh, or storytelling. And I think drumming actually may have preceded the storytelling, but I'm not sure. So um, this is probably the earliest way of taking people psychologically somewhere other than where they are physically. Um, cave art came along perhaps 30,000 years ago, perhaps longer. These are the paintings in a cave at Lascaux, France, and anthropologists uh, will, there's three major kind of explanations of what this, why they did this and what they mean, one of which was to capture the, the essence of the animal, the avatar of the animal, uh, so they'd be more successful at hunting for food. Um, theater came along. Manuscripts came along, then perhaps the first technology generating a paradigm shift came along, which was the printing press, so now people can share uh, virtual realities, at least vaguely through uh, the written word. Uh, that is the first photograph. Some of you have undoubtedly mm -hmm. seen that before and know what it is, mm -hmm. but if you haven't seen it before, it looks like a projected test. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to, uh, to know what it is. If you knew what it was when it was taken, then of course it seems obvious. Um, uh, so I'll give you two choices for those of you who don't know what it is. Okay. It's a picture 
of a uh, taken out of the uh, out of a window of a building, um, looking at buildings and a tree and stuff in the distance. That's choice number one. Choice number two is it's a picture taken from outside the window in, and it's actually a person at a drafting table. <laughs> How many vote for number one? Okay. How many vote for number two? It's number one. <laughs> So, you know, at a technological level, this is probably, you know, a, not too different than the first television pictures that came through. You know, if you knew what, you were, what was there, you could, you could kind of find it. Uh, also, if you go see the movie Hugo, for those of you who have seen that yeah. movie, it's a kind of wonderful uh, incorporation of a lot of this, a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> that's the first uh, known film projected to the public. That's a train, if you saw Hugo, you know about this too. That's a train leaving Ciotet uh, Station, and it was projected on a large white sheet, and the train, the, the camera had been placed uh, uh, very close to the to the tracks, and it was there's a moving in. Um, uh, some reports at the time in the newspapers in France that people ran out of the building terrified because here was this train coming uh, coming straight at them, and maybe that's true, maybe not, but there were a lot of people that were really. Uh, uh, really found this an incredible thing, as you might imagine. Um, that's Marconi's radio. Uh, uh, arguably, at least, the first radio built by an Italian. Other people suggest that the radio was really uh, designed uh, by Tesla. Um, good Croatian. I'm half Italian, half Croatian, so I don't lose. Okay. <laughs> and... Uh, does anybody know what that is? That's the first American television set. And how many people know who invented the television? One. Philo, more than one. Philo Farnsworth, right, which is where Philco, I think, comes from, uh, the company. Um, and of course, this, this is the little viewing screen, uh, and it was in the 20s, actually. And then things like the Depression and um, the Great Depression and World War II kind of interfered with the, the, the early development of, of television. Okay, now here's another device, not exactly a new one, but one I want to talk about to make a point. So if, if you know, if um, you saw somebody and they were, had their cell up to their ear, you, 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 for any reason you might ask them, who, who are you or who are you talking to? And they will say Linda or Richard or Renee or Jim or, or whatever, okay? But they're not. What they are talking to is with is a digitized representation in real time of somebody else's voice. That's an avatar. Okay, that's simply a vocal avatar. It's not totally high fidelity. In the early 1900s, AT&T uh, figured out what could be clipped off of the frequencies to send more phone calls over the wire. It's the same thing with MP3 <coughs> players and, and music. So we have come to accept the technology and are blind to the mediation between us and another person, even though we're listening to a degraded uh, avatar of, of that person. Um, <clears throat> Another thing I'd, I'd like to talk to, uh, uh, mention here, is something about is something about measures. So this is going to be more important a little, in a little bit in the, in this talk. That's the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. Okay. And um, that's Don Campbell. And Don Campbell in the fifties was asked by the museum, he was at Northwestern, of course, he uh, was asked by the museum to come up with ways of determining the most popular exhibit at that museum. And the museum is, it doesn't lend itself to counting people coming through doors. It's a lot of wide open spaces. One thing blends into another. So he thought, he thought, he thought, and he finally started looking at maintenance records. And <laughs> what he discovered was um, there was a place in the museum where the asphalt tiles on the floor had to be changed every six weeks because they were worn out that quickly. And that became his measure 
of what had to be the most popular exhibit at the at the museum. And anybody know what it what it was? It was the chick hatchery. So people just stood fascinated, you know, shuffling their feet around these uh, around these uh, incubators, and that led to the, um, the creation of this book, unobtrusive measures, you know, non non reactive research in the social sciences. And I bring this up because the technology we have today to do stuff in immersive virtual reality, particularly in the visual uh, in the visual side, uh, uh, as a byproduct gives us a lot of information, a lot of unobtrusive measures, which I'll explain in a sec. So, I'm not going to go through the technology in a big way, but <laughs> the way we do this to have visual reality along with sound, along with some haptics and other things, uh, is we have a tracking system. The tracking system can be a couple cameras, four cameras, eight cameras, ten cameras, and uh, <clears throat> um, it, it tracks an individual wearing a head-mounted display by virtue of a little light um, uh, on the top of the helmet and the top of the head right here, let's say. Uh, and it does that with three degrees of freedom. So it knows where that light is moving in three degrees of freedom in any space. And then <clears throat> it, with another sensing device, we happen to use inertial uh, tracking sensors and then another three degrees of freedom, uh, we get head orientation also in three degrees of freedom. And if you make the big assumption that the head never left the body, you know where somebody is looking. Defined as, uh, you, you can do that two ways. You can also add eye tracking, but it's, it's usually unnecessary. Uh, you know where a person's nose is pointed. And if you know where a nose is pointed and they're wearing a head-mounted display, you know what they're looking at. Because when people put on a head-mounted display, it's like using a pair of binoculars. You don't move your eyes, you move your head. If you have that information and you have a fast enough uh, computer, uh, you can then render back to individuals stereoscopically what they should be seeing in the digital world that you've created. And, um, and that happens very fast. We don't worry about simulator sickness anymore um, as, you know, as uh, uh, the number of polygons that can be processed in, in very short periods of time has, has increased. We really don't even really have to worry about that at all. Um, we get everything back to people in 40 milliseconds, and you know that's kind of good enough. More recently, things like the Kinect Tracker uh, have been invented. This is the Oculex Rift, which Oculex is a company that has lots of people's money, but is, hasn't delivered too many of these HMDs yet. Um, but the, the previous head-mounted display that you saw in the previous slide, I won't go back there, I guess, um, uh, cost $30,000. This one costs three hundred. So I'm, there are probably people in this room. Anybody have one? Yes? Okay. Do you? No. We're, We're waiting, too. We're waiting. Yeah. World Viz is still waiting, and, and other companies are still waiting. But... Um, uh, in 2002, in one of our papers, um, you, know, people, you know, people were asking, you know, well, geez, why would you ever spend $30,000 for one of these things? And it, it was only that, that high cost um, because the military is a place they used for most of them. But there were cheaper ones out even in the early 2000s. So there was a uh, Sony had one for $900, and uh, other, other places had, had them. And the problem was, if you put it on, it was like strapping a television to your head. It didn't add, add anything, really. Uh, it might have added 3D, but it, it didn't add much more, than, much more than that. So we said, you know, when tracking in the home gets really inexpensive, that's when uh, head-mounted displays will get cheap, and that's when people will really start getting into uh, more completely surrounding or arguably immersive kind of uh, technology. And uh, it won't be too long between there'll be, before there'll be an app and there may be one or two or three. I don't know. You guys may know better than, uh, better than I do. Um, and, you know, this is probably going to happen in the next couple of years. And so uh, 
uh, understanding, at least from our point of view, understanding you know what it is uh, about uh, VR that that's visually based as well as other uh, sensory information is is going to need uh, is going to mean for research, and we're going to talk about this as that as this goes on. Okay, so when that happens, there's going to be mountains of data. What kinds of data are there going to be? Did, we're going to know where everybody was. We're going to know, you know what people were, you know, what were looking at, how they reacted to what they're looking at, um, their movements, their gestures, their facial expressions, you know, through the Kinect kind of tracker or multiple Kinect kind of trackers. And this is just going to be one massive uh, set of field data. Um, <clears throat> the bigger problem is going to be, I think, who owns it, you know? Who's going to own those data? Is it going to be? Is it going to be? Um, is it going to be Microsoft? Is it going to be the? Is it going to be the people making the phone? You know, what is it going to be? The the, the amount of data that's coming is is just going to be massive. So so those of you who are fortunate enough to be young now and are learning all the statistical techniques, or even not so young and know all those uh, kind of techniques to really deal with these kinds of data sets. Um, uh, uh, you know, I see some people in the room, I'm sure are, and who actually stud study that in computer science. Um, it, it's just going to be incredible. And I, I, it, has a, it has a potential to revolutionize the way we do communication studies, the way we do social psychology, all, all sorts of stuff. And um, <clears throat> it's going to be cheap. So virtual reality tools are both endogenous and exogenous. So forth, how does it work? Now, in this sense, I'm talking about how it works in a social psychological way primarily. Unconscious processes don't care whether one's environment is virtual or physical. Um, conscious processes cannot always control the unconscious ones and sometimes don't, aren't motivated to do so. Uh, so the, a lot of this stuff is based on unconscious or automatic processes. Um, <clears throat> we have a model of social influence uh, within virtual reality, and we'll, we'll just concentrate on the visual, mo the visual aspects of that to, to exemplify it. And the first, this is a five-factor model. The, the first factor is simply uh, agency. What do we believe, for example, about an other representation that perhaps looks like a human? You know, is that... Is that an avatar that is an online uh, representation in real time of somebody, like like the phone, or is it an agent? <clears throat> is that just a, a representation of a computer algorithm? Um, and so your belief, whether it's true or not, is very important there. So this is kind of theory of mind of another representation in a in a virtual world. Um, uh, you know, what are avatars? We just decided that we, were, we used the term avatars to actually refer to an actual online representation of an actual person in real time. Everything else is an agent. And there, you know, there can be cyborgs and things like that in, uh, in between. Um, <clears throat> so we know about Agent Smith. We know about avatars. Um, <clears throat> the second, the second uh, important variable, the one on the ordinate here, is what we call communicative realism, which could be high or low. Okay. Now, um, and we'll get to what, well, what constitutes communicative realism. For us, uh, it seems the most important thing is movement realism. They can even argue about the vocal cords being, move, being movement realism. Second most important thing is anthropometric realism. So you can't do this without an arm and a hand. The least important is photorealism. And its importance lies mostly in connoting a specific personal identity. But even that isn't, has, doesn't, even that doesn't have to be so photorealistic. So many people here probably know that caricatures emphasize the unique aspect of anybody's head or face. And so we can tell, you know, that's President Obama or it's President Bush from a really odd kind of uh, uh, caricature. So, um, if we really believe that what we're looking at is an actual online representation of a, of a real person in, in real time, 
uh, it, it's really the motions and the movements and perhaps the anthropometrics that are important. Um, we know when we, we know it's not a real person in real time, uh, we're affected as well. And cartoonists have known this for a long time. But they can make us think a duck is a person or a mouse is a person. Or, uh, you know, the, if you really look at anthropometric realism on um, South Park, for example, it's really weird. But that doesn't change, that doesn't change much for us. Um, <clears throat> so that's communicative realism and agency. If you put those together, and this is just represented linearly as a function um, on this diagonal, you get increasing what some people call social presence. Um, and at some, uh, at some point on that social presence uh, curve, doesn't have to be linear, uh, there's a threshold of social influence such that if you really think this is an avatar, an actual person in real time, like that phone voice, you don't have to have as much communicative realism or even much communicative realism uh, to make a difference. Um, on the other hand, if you really think this is an agent, then in certain situations it might have to be quite high, and we'll get to those situations in a second. So that's the threshold of social influence within virtual environments. Um, <clears throat> there are some other factors that are important. One is self-relevance. So if the situation is very low in self-relevance, you may not need much realism at all. You know, what's the real difference between going to an ATM and a teller to cash a check? Not much. Um, <clears throat> you know, for moderate self-relevance, playing games, etc., cetera, uh, maybe it's a little bit higher. But for high self-relevance, you know, like, are you going to fall in love with this agent in a truly human sense? You know, you're going to be passing a Turing test of sorts, you know. It's got to be better than the Stepford husbands or Stepford wives kind of, kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> the next more most important, this is the fourth dimension now, is response system level. So this is a high self-relevant situation, and the model is now in three dimensions, and on the z-axis we have response system level, from automatic response system level to deliberate, okay, to conscious, kind of, to conscious kinds of, of things. And uh, notice that at the automatic level, um, even high self-relevance doesn't make much difference. And I won't do this because I don't see a garbage can, but this is a point when I would surreptitiously go up to a metal garbage can and kick it as hard as I could, and you would all jump. So I, 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 we're all spared of that. Uh, we're all spared of that today. Uh, so, um, you know, moderate self-relevance would be lower, uh, you know, and it could, be, it could be flat. It could be all sorts of ways. We're just, th these are just graphed uh, for illustration purposes. So that's how we think it works, and that's and that's how we that's how we study these things: self-relevance, response system level, and oh, finally context. Okay, so the context can make it easier or harder uh, to have a lot of social influence. And the the the, the 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 example or illustration that most people use about that is playing the kids' game of hot and cold. In fact, there are computers you can play hot and cold with now, and you really couldn't tell the difference if it was if you didn't know it if it was a person doing it or a computer doing it. Why? Because the context is simple. The level of communication, the number of words you have to understand, the number of directions you have to understand is quite limited. So context makes a big difference. Okay, so how it works. Um, <clears throat> digital virtual reality represents a paradigm shift in communication media uh, with uh, implications for social, psychological, communication, and other kinds of research in both a basic and applied sense. Um, I'll just give you a couple of quick examples of, of things. Um, we did a shoot 'em up study in 2008 that involved people shooting, participants shooting at, uh, at uh, others, you know, from behind some, uh, behind some barriers. We tracked not only the person, but we tracked the gun with six degrees of of freedom, we could tell where the bullets were going and to the other side. Uh, we never rendered the arm, but about half our subjects reported seeing their arm, um, probably because of the proprioceptic feedback from the, or kinesthetic feedback from the, from the hand and arm movements. Uh, before they, before they uh, started shooting, they, they wound up either shooting at African-American looking agents or Anglo-American looking agents, and they knew they were agents, not avatars. 
And we said, we want you just to walk up behind that agent and look at the number on that agent's neck. And um, so they did that. And uh, they were shooting against two. They were either both black or both Anglo. And um, what we found uh, was that in the black agent condition, the distance they maintained between themselves and the agent when they went to look for the number at the, on the agent's back okay, was predictive of the perceived hostility and fatality of the gunshot, okay. but only in the black agent condition. Okay. If you want to see the, uh, the actual paths, these are the distributions. These are, I think, 30, uh, 30 millisecond samples of how they walked from uh, from up here to where the agent was standing, and you can see this distribution overlaps, but uh, it is significantly different. This is against the, the white agent. So this just illustrates one of the things that you get for free in this research. Because you're tracking people to know where they're looking and where they are at all times, you get unbelievable proxemic data. And those data turn out to be, in our experience, very, very sensitive. Um, we've moved on to other things. Um, uh, We've created the sham magnet uh, because it's a lot cheaper to pilot test VR stuff and other stuff, cardiovascular physiological stuff, in a, um, in a sham magnet as opposed to our actual magnet uh, down the hall. And this uh, is a live demo and it, uh, you know, we put people on a table and it took us a week to figure out how we're gonna move that table into the magnet. You know, and we realized we could do it virtually, it didn't have to move really. <laughs> Only took us a week. <laughs> and, uh, and so we were testing out cardiovascular responses to potentially threatening situations uh, in, in the sham magnet to see if we could get anything before we moved into the, into the actual magnet and then had to uh, uh, secure the help of Biopac and Alan and others to, to, do, to tread where nobody has tread before. Uh, but the stu this study actually worked out pretty well. Uh, long story short, what we found was when people were doing a task inside the magnet compared to laying down or sitting sitting up inside the virtual magnet, they were threatened uh, cardiovascularly almost all the time. A big shift. To, and that may have big implications for FMR studies uh, if all we're studying is threatened subjects when they're in the magnet. Okay. We did another study where that didn't happen. I tried to find out, well, why? And it dawned on me that we put people in the magnet and it was a signal detection task of people drawing a gun or a, or a, a cell phone out of their, their pocket and we got the predicted things without the shift. And the reason why was that while they were in the virtual magnet, they just went to the experimental task virtually. So they were psychologically taken out of the magnet that we just put them in. Uh, uh, so there's a cure for this and, and at the Brain Imaging Center uh, there are now tracking systems that uh, are used and are playing with, and so uh, uh, that, and then we've done a cardiovascular study for which we're uh, analyzing the data to see if the cardiovascular data in terms of indexing, which is a whole other talk, in indexing motivational state of challenge versus threat, a positive versus kind of negative state, if those data can clean up the FMR data. Uh, one of our colleagues, Mike Miller, studies individual differences in, in bold signal analyses. And sometimes, and Renee and others here know about this, and so sometimes, you know, the aggregate brain from a study doesn't look like anybody in the study's brain. And so we're trying to remove that variance from, from those studies. Uh, we talked about market research before. Um, uh, there's there are persuasion studies. Some of you may know about this study. It was in Public Opinion Quarterly a couple years ago. That's Jeremy Balinson. That's uh, uh, W. That's W and Jeremy. And what he was able to do was to Knowledge Network get about 1,500 people from a representative national sample to send in their photograph for some study. And then three weeks later, those same people were contacted for a different study. And he did all the various combinations of, of morphing their photo into political candidates. In some studies, they were well-known political candidates. In some studies, they were just political candidates. And it, uh, if I recall the data, it, it, it shifted the vote to a landslide in the direction of the person who was, um, uh, with, with whom that, that one's picture was, was morphed. Um, so 
digital virtual reality represents a paradigm shift in communication media with implications for things like persuasion, market research, and all sorts of uh, other things. Um, finally, <laughs> digital virtual reality has important implications for external uh, validity. And in two ways, classic and future. So as social psychologists and others, communication people, for example, you know, we're looking to generalize to what I call grounded reality, you know, or what other people would call the real world. And <clears throat> what we do is we try to create an empirical uh, analog of that. And we've done this with every media ever invented, paper and pencil stories, you know, just the whole, whole thing. So now we can do it digitally, uh, so we can create an empirical virtual reality. But that concept is not tied to digital. When you give somebody a, a scenario, you're trying to put them in a virtual place, etc. Um, and so <clears throat> we do our studies and analyze our data, and we draw a conclusion, and we generalize back to grounded reality. Now, aside from representative sampling issues, um, that strengthen that connection and, and generalizing that conclusion is moderated by the nature of the differences between the virtual reality and the grounded reality. So in the first half of our, or two-thirds of our work, we were really <coughs> trying to do this, so that that moderation would be lessened. Okay? But given what some of the things I've talked about today and what seems to be happening technologically, at least a billion websites, 30 plus billion web pages, 3 billion people online, there's I don't know how valid these data are, but you know, there's more people, there's more cell phones in the world than toilets. Um, and we were discussing this in class last night, and somebody, uh, this is a number that's floating around. That 85% of the world's population is wired for mobile. That doesn't mean smartphones, it just means wired for mobile. Um, so that's amazing. What that means is we're not going to be able to play six degrees of Kevin Bacon much longer. <laughs> there will be no degrees of, of separation. Uh, and this is going to create a paradigm shift, much like the printing press did, in terms of, in terms of research anyway. Okay, that stuff. This is what's happening. Grounded reality for a lot of people is digital virtual reality. And now. So with those three tools that I showed in the slide before this, um, and those masses of data, you know, we're going to get around a lot of problems somehow, problems of generalizability, uh, problems of, of uh, you know, we start doing censuses almost, uh, but, uh, and, uh, and, representative, and representative samples. So, uh, we'll all be performing field experiments. So in summary, Virtual and physical reality are not clearly differentiated by humans. Virtual reality is a state of mind. You don't have to believe all this, but I do. Um, virtual reality tools are both endogenous and exogenous, and unconscious processes don't care. And market researchers, well, market researchers and others can avail themselves of the power of digital virtual environments. And virtual reality has important implications for external, uh, external validity. And I'll stop there. And Thank you for your kind attention, and if there's time for questions, I'll